Um, I have a question for Joy about the uh, the data for um, uh, the variation that, that you find. I'm wondering about speaker structured variation versus general free variation. Um, so, so you, you had some really interesting patterns in the data. I'm wondering if speakers are um, consistent in how um, how variable they are, or whether some people are more categorical towards one pattern and others are more categorical towards one pattern. Yeah, that's a great question. At this point, I'm, I'm at a stage where I can answer that impressionistically. It's not something that I've systematically looked at just yet. I am um, coding this kind of data takes a lot of work and a lot of time um, because you have to really do it by hand. It's something you can automate. Um, and so I recently finished going through all of my data. Um, so at this point, that is something I would like to look at. What I what I did notice was very clearly, well, the reason this came to my mind is noticing that one of my speakers in particular, there just, there just wasn't much at all. I mean, very few of these wild card, very nouns, her use of Sala and La seem to follow patterns that we might expre expect more out of the English speaker. Um, and I, I think that is mainly because of um, a, a couple of aspects of her sociolinguistic profile. So she is the only one of my subjects who was not born on the island, but born to immigrants who came both from the island to the UK. Um, so she's quite a quite fluent user. Um, but that is one aspect of her background. Another one being that she took it upon herself um, to create um, materials that can be used if you are someone who, for whom this is a heritage language and you'd like to learn. And so I think because most of the people that she's teaching are English speakers, it, there is a pressure, I think this is a pressure that may not just be unique to Creole languages, but that comes up a lot when you are trying to promote them for linguistic study and for use, unfortunately, one of the pressures that comes in among the speaking population is to make it seem very traditionally systematic in order to give it um, maybe this, this uh, sense of, of legitimacy among the people who are striving to learn it. And of course, as, as we as linguists know, all these languages vary and have these interesting idiosyncrasies that we like to study, so it makes them fun. But if you are trying to teach this language to um, a group of English speakers, I think she tries to align her grammar more with things that they would expect out of a demonstrative in a definite form. Um, and so her files in particular showed up to me as having that distinct quality. I would like to look more at my other speakers who have a very different background sociolinguistically from her and see if they vary systematically. I'm not sure, but I would expect so. They come from different cities on the island. Um, yes, and actually that was going to be my question, whether you if you meant you called it an English education. Mm -hmm. So controlling for that then what remains. Because that's what you uh like, you know, for me that was meant like seems like the lower hanging fruit in terms of your data analysis. Also age, I I would want to see you know, I would expect well, I, don't know. I would expect a difference in age, but I don't know which direction because I don't know the, the, the history of the of the Creole and uh, but yeah. So the farther away from the educational uh, uh, traditional you know, the, the traditional educational system, I would expect more of the, more the wild cards and then the more systematicity in the usage. That is um, that is definitely possible. The the speaker that I noticed um, had more of this. Um, these very finely, more finely demarcated categories for when these items show up. Um, she is not my youngest speaker, but she's my second to youngest speaker. Um, the range was 58 to 82. Um, the, when it comes to, to educational background, there have been a few different stages. I won't go into everything in it, but at the time that my oldest speakers were being educated on the island, it was, it was savagely beaten out of you to use this language. Um, and so it was something you spoke illicitly among friends, an ability you hid from your parents who wanted you to be in an English-only environment. Um, whereas my younger speaker is part of um, a group that's trying to now promote its use who had a slightly different educational experience, especially since she's in the UK. So that, that might also I think I have a question for Emma. 
So you were comparing the affectivity of words with these um, two different suffixes, looking at texts um, from different um, centuries, right? And so my question is whether you were able to determine whether the texts um, have similar topics, whether the texts are written in a similar register or with a similar type of reader in mind, um, such that some of the differences you're noting, my question is whether any of the differences you're noting might actually be sourced in the, um, the style of the text or the topic of the text. Uh, right, yeah, that's a great question. Uh, the texts are definitely like very different from like, and yeah, they come from different writers or different audiences, different genres. There's poetry, there's uh, there are letters. Uh, so yeah, uh, so the work involves a lot of like going through critical editions of the stacks and going to glossaries, trying to find dictionaries of like these periods. Uh, so I think yeah, there's a risk of, of finding that, but as far as I, I've seen, like Words are, tend to be very consistent across different texts in their in their being, like uh, having a negative after affect or not. But of course, in different texts, it's going they're going to be mobilizing different ways. And negative affect words are going like will tend to appear in, in, in different texts. So there's there's for instance these two different sets of canticles from uh, the 1300s, which are like canticles for Saint Mary and can canticles that are supposed to be. Like okay, like more critical of authority figures and critical of like behaviors at the time. So negative affect terms tend to appear in like more in the second set, but they also appear in the canticles of Saint Mary to to but in a context of like uh, like reprehending bad behavior that is not like conducive to uh, so. So there seems to be a, a consistency in the meanings, but in but like a, a sharp difference in how much these terms are mobilized or are uh, in different texts. So yeah, I think it's there's but there's definitely a risk that I'm going to be missing something, but that's why also the data set is available and a subject to edition something. <laughs> Go ahead, Nick was the Sir, and I have kind of a question. I'll try to say it in more specific terms first and in more general terms. So, uh, Joy, uh, you mentioned uh, this possibility of animacy playing a role. Uh, I thought this was really striking. It made me think, if, in particular, about other sort of uh, semantic uh, features you might say, if you want to look at. And this goes as well for the definite in this sort of research because. And so these examples were, were very typically using animate things, or concrete things. And I wonder how concreteness, imageability, and these other sort of psychometric factors might play a role in the acceptability of these. So I, I took it in my own head something I got from Ted Ross a long time ago, which is can you substitute toenail in and how well does this go? <laughs> so you have uh, the tone, toenails are widespread across humans. It strikes me as much worse than a toenail is associated with humans. It's also, you know, so um, I wonder what these uh, sort of others, uh, you know, one might say purely semantic features play in these things. And then the more general question would be uh, for all of you uh, what sort of affiliations do individual lexical items have with all of these different constructions, and what can those associations tell us about other development across time, for example. Why does this particular form take a negative connotation? Was it associated with particular forms that were negatively, uh, effectively loaded already, and then so this uh, is a now becomes something negative, or are there particular forms that only show up in one or two of these different uh, morphological structures that you have that might uh, tell us something about those methods and so on. So these are my questions. Can I go first because I might have to be worried. Um, so I don't think animacy, so the two, I don't think animacy plays a role in kind reference because I could say um, the uh, 
Colonials evolved, you know, we didn't work with some such thing in the human evolution, you know, some later form, something like that. I think you would get inanimate objects and invent light bulbs, you know. So you have to control for the predicate, but I think there wouldn't be a role of animacy per se. That's my gut level reaction. In the domain of the, you know, when I talked about incorporation, there it really plays a role because it's much easier to conceptualize um, objects as just part of an activity when they're inanimate. So the vast majority of incorporation structures involve inanimate. But for languages like pseudo-incorporation, it's the animate ones that tell you for sure you're dealing with incorporation because they're case mark. There are other things that play a role. So I think animacy is definitely relevant to these issues. Um, but my sense is more in the domain of the ordinary individual being part of an incorporation structure. But, um, as far as for my case, I, I don't get the impression that animacy would be terribly re relevant to my Dix's marking dilemma. A lot of the cases that I was looking at um, within my corpus, of course, because of the gesture experiments I did, they're usually pointing at inanimate objects with the situation I put them in. Um, but I'm wondering if it might be relevant to some of my bare noun usage. Um, not in all cases. I mean, a lot of the ones that I, I saw come up are things that are inanimate but within the community. So a reference to maybe the river in the area or a particular um, um, part of town. But then I do see things coming up where um, that even remind me a little bit of, of usages in um, idiosyncratic usages in British English where you might say, I'm going to hospital. And so things like that would, would show up for, for hospital, for um, physiotherapists, for, for things like that, where they were kind of um, occupations and whatnot. But I, I still find it for things like frog within my, within my kids' story. So I am wondering about that. Um, as far as, I haven't thought too much about other kind of semantic uh, features I would like to look at, but something that I would like to look at is across different discourse situations. So I want to compare my storytelling results to my conversation results to my gesture activity results because storytelling, you know, you have technically you have a speaker and a hearer, but it's not interactive, not the way that I had it set up for narrating a picture book. And that might bring me different dynamics in terms of more syntactic marking for oldest and newness than if I actually have an active interlocutor. Um, so those are some things in particular I'd like to look at more carefully. <coughs> and can you just review your pattern? Uh, well, that's yeah, so the thing I think that also all of these kind of the discovered the specific lexical items that are associated with any of these constructions, either the use in the bare plural. I mean, you know, it's not like as if everything is loaded in equally, or in, in the case of the it's not like everything is going to show up uh, with this particular morphological marker, right? Even so the, if it's productive. There's distributional qualities to the use of words that you buy some to like it and some to not like it. And, and what, uh, is there anything that looking at these distributional profiles of the actual words that are associated with this morphing can tell us about the emergence of this effective interpretation for that? Yeah, I don't think so. Yeah, uh, I, I think it's like arose from, like, so there are lots of doublets, and, uh, like, there have been lots of doublets throughout the history of the language, and, like, words changing from one suffix to the other, depending on the interpretation, so, you know, I don't think there are other distributions. But it, it always just negative, and so you judge the quality of the cement change in the effective domain on whether it associates with one or the other. Oh, no, 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 yeah, no, then, then I'm looking at the context. Okay, let's go to Larry first. Uh, just a, a short uh, point on, on Joy's uh, classification of the information status categories. Uh, the the uh, category of inferables from Prince's work, which overlaps very largely with Herb's uh, bridging notion, uh, for, for Prince, that kind of was not part of her her two by two matrix, but more recently Betty Berner, uh, Prince's grad student, I guess, uh, has suggested that um, the fourth cell of Prince's um, 1992 matrix, namely uh, 
here are new, but this course old uh, would be a good fit for inferables, which uh, have some properties uh, of uh, other discourse uh, old expressions, like the, the use of the definite, but also uh, here are new, uh, intonation in English, she also talks about Farsi. So I was wondering whether um, the, you know, the, the Creole language that you discuss might uh, have additional uh, you know, grounds for collapsing that within the two by two here old discourse old uh, matrix and not having that kind of be outside the categorization. I, you can get rid of one of your colors, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> I went back and forth about that. I actually, it's it's something that's actually, it's, it's definitely not a new debate, even within Francis' work. She mentions it in right. one of her, her 92 paper. Um, and goes, she herself really goes back and forth about, you know, maybe, you know, within a context where there's been this extensive discussion of, say, a bus, and then you bring up the driver, maybe for some that would be marked as inferable, for others they would consider that to be of the here new discourse right. variety, depending on what particular aspects are in, um, were in the preceding context. And so, since there didn't seem to be much decision within the framework on how to categorize those. For now, I went ahead and highlighted those under this kind of inferable category, mainly so I could go back and look at them. Yeah. Um, because what exactly would be necessary within the context surrounding that particular kind of referent to put it with squarely within that matrix or give it kind of this unique inferable category? I'm, I'm not quite sure myself at this point to handle it. There does seem to be something sort of special about them, regardless of what you call them, because we usually expect this kind of oldness and newness to, to modulate together, but then you have this strange situation where you have something that would be sort of previously mentioned, but it's still new to the person listening. I, I think whatever you call that, it's going to have a, a pretty unique category in terms of how we consider it to work on a cognitive level. There must be an extra assumption of availability to, to inferencing abilities um, regardless of I just which term So, so I think I missed something in your talk, so you may have answered this question, but you can answer it. Um, so, there were two parts to, to your story. One was um, what you can get out of a statistical rela relation in some kind of you know, accumulated episodic representations, like the statistical relation between temporal, um, temporal order and causal order, um, such that the sense that in that in those uses could express either. Right? Um, but in your essay, you see, um, example, um, you pointed out that um, one thing that drives um, the creation of a new, of a new sub suffix and the creation of a mark and an unmarked one is there has to be some context that would differentiate the two. Um, and in order to then learn the, 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 the negative connotation of one of those, there, it already has to be there, like it is between since and since. So where does that come from? Yeah, right. Uh, that's a very good question. <laughs> I think that's that's a general problem in morphology that we don't know about, <laughs> right? So there are lots of cases where because of the sense since you had a story full of right. Yes, yes. So uh, easy was definitely already there before the negative connotation, and we know that because it, like. If we look at the distribution of affect in EC words in the early stages of the language, there was like a more even distribution, right? It was similar to ESA. And then it, it's a very great question. Okay, how so is it driving there being two of them? Right, that's a good that's a great question. And uh, one possible way of like uh, of, of, of understanding that is that uh, the, com the communities of Portuguese speakers were, were not like homogeneous. There were different communities, and maybe uh, like the larger community was using ESA, but one of the communities started using EC. And one reason, one 
that might be one thing. So and suddenly then you have a community that has these two options that came from different subset of the, the subsets of the community, and new learners are going to have to interpret that distribution, and they may pick up the most market element of that distribution, or the least frequent, frequent one, as the one who has the most market. Uh, another way this why the situation might have come about, and and this might be the correct one, is that uh, so in many, in, in many uh, steps in the evolution of the language, there have been uh, attempts to bring suffixes from more like culturally um, uh, valued contexts. So there's this hypothesis that EC came as a borrowing from French, right? So, uh, so that's, that, might, that might have come about through translations of text, where someone like a, a, a cap that suffix EC, or just by borrowing. Yeah, so like there, even in later stages of the language, in other domains of Portuguese morphology, there have been many borrowings from Latin, where people like took uh, more like this learned suffixes, and they became a part of the language, even though there was a another like vernacular suffix to express that meaning. And then the question is, once you have that, this, 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 this two suffixes, how does it get associated with it? Yeah, and then, then learners will, will interpret this reality in some way. Um, we have time for maybe two more questions, so um, yeah. So my question was prompted by Joe's talk. Uh, so I was just wondering whether there is any phonological or prosodic predictor that's going to tell us when the speakers might be more likely to use one more syllable in the circles, right? So it depends on the meaning, to what extent it's homologically efficient. And then I guess it relates to like a bigger question for both of you. Uh, when we put ourselves in the speaker's shoe, then well, the speaker has to be planning a lot of things at the same time. Meaning is one thing, or we need to choose one form, we need to decide which options sound better, right? So, but when you're a researcher, you just see a produced form, and then you, we have this inclination that well, there's a form difference that should mean something different. So to what extent do we need to care about it? Do we want it? How can we care about other issues, including homological constraints, that the speaker or the writer does not really consider? So for this first wave um, of, of coding and research, Prosody is not something I've looked at yet. It's something that I would like to, though, um, because of my interest in these other aspects of, of production and of structure, et cetera. And so what I made sure to do when I collected my data was I got everything audio visually recorded to the highest quality that I possibly could um, using you know, like new mics and, and whatnot. So I was hoping that the data I collected was collected uh, well enough that I can actually do some sort of prosodic mapping onto it and see if there's some sort of correlation. That would be very helpful for me because, as you've noticed, there's a lot of overlap in terms of actual meaning and function. And I do wonder if, if maybe there's some aspect of, of prosodic efficiency um, going on. So, so thank you. That, that is the sort of thing. Yeah, I think that's all the time we have at the moment. Um, let's thank our speakers.